Let's introduce now Inigo Murica. Um, it's always difficult to introduce Inigo because uh, he had 10 life in one, so I cannot explain everything what Inigo did in his career. Um, the main point I think to, to keep in mind is that Inigo is recognized as a coach. Um, he worked uh, a lot in cycling, uh, especially with uh, a Scaltel cycling team, but uh, he is also the trainer of several uh, very good triathletes, elite triathletes, including Ainoa Murua and uh, Eneko Lianos. Um, Inigo uh, has been also involved in the following of different sports. Um, for example, he is working a lot with Frédéric Vernieu, who is the, the coach of Mireia Belmonte, actually one of the best swimmer in the world. Inigo is also uh, a world-class scientist. Uh, he published more than 100 scientific papers and is the, one of the editors of the International Journal of Sport Physiology and Performance. Okay, welcome Inigo. We're gonna speak about the scientific basis of training for endurance performance. And these are the areas that I would like to cover this morning. Uh, first of all, resistance training and endurance performance 15 years ago. And this is uh, a little bit in relationship with uh, Darren's presentation uh, immediately before. Then we're gonna speak about resistance training and endurance performance today. And we will particularly focus on some observations in running, some observations in cycling, and then other endurance sports, including, of course, triathlon. And I want to emphasize a little bit about the work in swimming. Then we will have a look at the mechanisms for strength training induced endurance gains. Uh, I will have a word about the optimization of concurrent strength and endurance training. And then I will finish with some conclusions and practical implications. I think this is one of the best books available about uh, sports performance 15 years ago. It was written by John Hooley and Louis Burke. And if you go to the chapter dedicated to strength training for endurance performance, you will find these quotes. A strength or power measured in non-rowing circumstances often seems to have little value when applied to rowing performance. And this comes from a rowing physiologist. Many top riders do not do weight training, particularly the European professionals. However, this does not mean weight training is not useful. And this comes from a strength training coach of American cyclists. I firmly believe in resistance training with heavy weights. So long as I taper sufficiently before a race, I feel they improve my performance. And this comes from a, a medal winner at the Olympics, a swimmer. So as you can see, there is the opinion of it doesn't do anything, it's not worth it, or it could help, but people don't do it. And then it definitely helps. And the reason for that is that the work that was available 15, 18 years ago at the time of the Sydney Olympics, the first Olympics with triathlon, is th that work was not conclusive at all. We didn't have hard evidence to support the use of strength training for improving endurance performance. So the main conclusions from the work that was available 15, 18 years ago are summarized in these sentences by John Hooley and Louis Burke. For the highly trained athletes who are already capable of generating high power outputs in their chosen discipline, further improvements in strength are a less important factor in enhanced endurance performance. So if you are already strong enough, becoming stronger is not gonna make you faster in your sport. At the highest level of competition, increases in strength and power per se are not as critical to successful performance as the development of correct technique. So maybe the time that athletes, endurance athletes were spending in the gym would be better utilized developing a better uh, technique in their chosen sport. The bottom line is that modern training studies, modern 15 years ago, uh, do not support the use of resistance training programs for improving the performances of highly trained athletes. 
And this was based on the evidence that was available at the time these texts were written. Fortunately, in the past 15 years, there has been a lot of work done in this area that completely changes the, per the perspective that we have now about resistance training for endurance performance. And that is what we are going to be looking at in the next, uh, in the next half hour or so. Uh, firstly, we are gonna speak about strength training for endurance running performance. And in that sense, there is a, a, a key study that was done by Pavo Leinen and colleagues in, in 1999. What they, did, what they did was replace in an experimental group 32% of their training by explosive strength training. And then they had a control group that it's not that they did no strength training at all, but they only replaced 3% of their training by explosive strength. And what you see here is simply the periodization of that type of training in the, uh, in the experimental group and the control group. The main findings of this study uh, were as follows. The first one, the most important one, running performance. It only improved in the experimental group that was doing explosive strength. It didn't change in the control group. The main reason for this performance gain was, as you can see here, a reduction in the ground contact time about which Darren uh, spoke previously. And this was the, uh, the reason why these athletes were able to reduce their oxygen cost. Only the experimental group in the solid line was able to be more economical when running. The total oxygen cost of running at a given speed was significantly reduced. And that was one of the first studies to, do, to show this type of result in highly trained endurance athletes. This is another study that, that was done in highly trained middle distance and half marathon runners at the Australian Institute of Sport. It was done by Philo Saunders and colleagues. And one of the main advantages of this study is that it gives you a precise description of the nine-week training program. Nine-week training program with plyometric training. And you can see the exact exercises that they did in week one, weeks two to five, week six to nine, first session of the week, second session of the week. Here you get the exercises and here you get the sets and the number of repetitions. So if someone is interested, they can replicate this study that was very, very effective at improving the, uh, the running economy of these already highly trained athletes. What you see here is the change in the oxygen uptake when these athletes were running at 14 kilometers an hour, 16 kilometers an hour, and the more performance specific speed of 18 kilometers an hour. And what you see is that only the group doing the plyometric training in addition to endurance training had a significant reduction in the VO2 uptake at 14 kilometers an hour, but especially at 16 and 18 kilometers an hour. So very clearly, doing plyometric strength training was an effective way of improving the running economy of these athletes who were already very highly trained. The question might come of uh, what type of strength training is more interesting for this type of athlete? And this is a study, a study that was done by uh, Nicolas Berryman at Montreal um, a few years ago in which they compared plyometric training versus dynamic weight training and its effects on running economy. What you see here is that the athletes that did dynamic weight training for eight weeks significantly improved their energy cost of running. You see the individual values in the, in the thin lines and the mean values in the solid line. But so did the group doing plyometric training. So both methods were effective at improving the energy cost of running, whereas they had a control group in which there was absolutely no change, which is what you expect from a control group. So they had two main conclusions from this study. The first one was that coaches should plan a, a strength training periodization that emphasizes explosive strength and plyometric training to reduce the prevalence of injury and, and improve the cost of running. And the second conclusion, a little bit more focused on individual athletes, said that 
athletes with a high initial cost of running, so those who were not economical at the beginning, will benefit from explosive strength training focusing on intensity. Whereas athletes who already have a low cost of running should focus on increasing training volume or training intensity. This is a meta-analysis that was published this year. I don't expect you to read all these numbers because I can't even read them from here. But the main thing is that if you look at the, uh, the effects of resistance, plyometric, and explosive strength training on running economy, this meta-analysis indicates that traditional resistance training might be superior to plyometric training, but any type of resistance training might have a positive effect on running economy on endurance athletes who are not doing any strength work. Improved neuromuscular function likely plays a role in the enhancement in running economy and performance. Changes in running style that result in more efficient gait patterns, kinematics and kinetics, might also improve the economy of runners following plyometric or explosive resistance training. But future studies should examine movement-specific forms of resistance uh, training such as heel running, hypergravity, or running through sand. So some of the practical aspects that uh, Darren mentioned before. We know we can work on strength and improve running economy with those methods, but there is no the hard scientific evidence to indicate the best possible strategies. So if we move to uh, the effects of uh, strength training for endurance cycling performance, there is a study that was done in New Zealand back in 2005 uh, with track cyclists. And what they did was analyze the, uh, the effects of explosive and high resistance training on cycling performance. They looked at a program uh, of explosive and high resistance and the effect on one kilometer mean power, four kilometer mean power, peak power, oxygen cost, lactate profile power, and the main worry of endurance athletes when it comes to strength training. What is going to happen to body mass? Am I gonna get huge? If I get big, then I have to go up that hill. What am I gonna do with it? So what they saw was that the experimental group improved one kilometer power by about 9%, four kilometer power by 8.4%, peak power by 7%, there was a 3% reduction in the oxygen cost of cycling. Uh, the lactate profile improved by 5.5%, and all of this without a concomitant increase in body mass. So the main conclusion from that study uh, was that both looking at percentage gains and also looking at qualitative changes, you could say that you are almost certainly going to improve your one kilometer power, your four kilometer power, your peak power, and you are almost certainly not going to improve your body mass if you do the right type of strength training, that is explosive and heavy load type of training. But we are talking about cycling, and we know that cycling can be on the track and it can be done on the road. This is a study that was done by um, Per Agard and his colleagues in Denmark with highly trained national team cyclists, road cyclists. And for 18 weeks, 16 weeks, sorry, they had a group doing strength training plus endurance training and a control group doing only endurance training. And they looked at the effect of this program on a 45 minute time trial. As you can see here, the strength and endurance group significantly improved their mean power during that 45 minute time trial performance, whereas there was no change in, uh, in the mean power of the endurance only group. So these guys, by doing 16 weeks of heavy strength training, were able to improve their average power during a 45 uh, minute effort. But of course, road cyclists also go out on the road and cycle for hours. And quite often you don't see a change in their performance if you analyze the mean power over three hours or over four hours. But my friend uh, Ben Ronestad had the great idea of saying, well, how does cycling work? In cycling, normally 
you win the stage by being stronger in the final climb or by producing a breakaway towards the end of a stage or by being able to bridge a breakaway towards the end of a stage. So what they did was a, a protocol in which they had the subjects cycling for three hours at a steady uh, submaximal intensity and then they quantified the mean power output that power output that they were able to produce during the final push. That is, during a five minute time trial at the end of those three hours of a steady state cycling. And they had one group doing endurance plus strength for 12 weeks and another group doing only endurance. And as you can see here, the group doing concurrent strength and endurance was able to significantly improve their mean power in those final five minutes from 375 watts to 400 watts, whereas there was no change in that final push in the group that was doing only endurance training. Some of these studies are often criticized because uh, they are designed by adding strength to the endurance training. So a lot of people say, yeah, but the experimental group is doing extra work. They are training more because everyone is cycling the same amount and then you are adding some work. So to avoid this criticism, Bent Ronestad designed a study in which they made sure that the total training time was exactly the same in the endurance plus strength group and in the endurance group. 11.3, 15.2, 11.7, 15.3. So basically the same time of training for both the experimental and the control group. And what they found in this study was that maximal aerobic power only improved significantly in the experimental group doing strength work. No change in the control group doing only endurance. Power at the onset of blood lactate accumulation, that is the exercise intensity associated with, uh, with a lactate concentration of four millimoles, improved in the experimental group, it did not change in the control group. Peak torque angle was significantly reduced in the group doing a strength work, and it did not change in the endurance group. This means that they were able to start producing peak power early on each pedal cycle. And if you multiply that for thousands and thousands of pedal cycles, you end up with an improvement in the power during a 40 minute time trial, only in the experimental group, but no in the control group. And they also found a significant correlation between the change in the angle, the change in the angle of peak torque and the change in mean power output during the time trial. So those athletes who had a biggest change in the angle of application of peak torque were the athletes who were able to improve their mean power the most during that 40 minute time trial. So the conclusion was that elite cyclists for performing 10 weeks of strength development and 15 weeks of strength maintenance improved more in uh, maximum power and mean 40 minute time trial power and this correlated with earlier peak torque during the pedal stroke. Based on this uh, evidence that I have shown you about running and cycling, Bent and I wrote uh, a review paper last year uh, with the following conclusions. Recent research on highly trained athletes indicates that strength training can be successfully prescribed to enhance endurance performance. This is a very different conclusion from, those, from the conclusion that uh, John Hooley and Louis Burke wrote 18 years ago. For cycling performance, heavy strength training with maximal velocity during the concentric phase is preferred. While both heavy strength training with maximal velocity during, during the concentric phase and explosive strength training have additive, additive effects on running performance. So very clearly, nowadays we have enough solid evidence to support the use of heavy strength training and plyometric training to improve the performance of highly trained runners and cyclists. And this type of result has been shown in many different endurance sports, including swimming, running, cycling, triathlon, rowing, cross-country skiing. So basically, 
or Olympic endurance sports, either by directly improving performance or by improving strength markers that have been associated with endurance performance. So we are now going to have a look at uh, other endurance sports. And of course, I'm going to start with triathlon. I think the first available study uh, on that topic was done by Gregoire Millet back in 2002. And what they did was a 14-week program with strength and endurance, heavy strength, so always above 90% of 1RM, two times a week, or only endurance training. And what they saw was that the concurrent group here on your left uh, significantly improved the velocity at VO2 max, uh, significantly reduced uh, running economy, and they had a gain in hopping power, which is a, a repeated jumping test uh, for 10 seconds. So clearly in this study, additional heavyweight training led to improved maximal strength, velocity at VO2 max, and running economy. And this was probably determined by an improvement in lower limb stiffness regulation with no significant effects on VO2 max and VO2 kinetics during heavy exercise, during high intensity exercise. The inclusion of additional heavyweight training in the training program of well-trained endurance triathletes was therefore recommended back in 2002. Christoph Hauswirth and, and his colleagues here at INSEP did another study uh, more recently in 2010 in which for five weeks they had a group doing heavy strength plus endurance, again more than 90% of 1RM, in this case three times per week, or a group doing only endurance training. And what they did was a two-hour cycling uh, bout at uh, the ventilatory threshold one plus three percent, so slightly above the first ventilatory threshold. And as you can see here, they looked at the freely chosen cycling cadence. What they saw was that in the endurance group, as the time trial, as the two-hour time trial goes on, there is a clear drop, there is a clear drop in the freely chosen cycling cadence, indicative of neuromuscular fatigue. On the other hand, in the group doing endurance and strength training, there is an initial drop in the first part of the time trial in that freely chosen cycling cadence, but then they are able to maintain that cadence for the remainder of the time trial. So there is basically a reduction in the level of neuromuscular fatigue that these athletes are showing as a consequence of this heavy uh, weightlifting program. Additional heavy weight training can prevent the muscular fatigue induced decrease in free cycling chosen cadence observed during a two hour constant intensity cycling exercise. And concurrent endurance and strength training improves the level of maximal isometric force and decreases the heart rate at the end of a two hour cycling task. So clearly, at least we have two studies indicating the potential value of heavy strength training in, in triathlon, both for running and in this case for cycling. What I'm going to show you next, a bit like uh, what Warren did, uh, Darren did, is a personal experience of what I have been doing in terms of strength training for, uh, for triathlon. I consider core stability absolutely key, absolutely necessary. And I do this daily, all season long. And it's not written on the program. It has to be done. I don't care whether it's done before training, after training, before breakfast, uh, while they are watching the news. It simply has to be done every single day. Normally, at the beginning of the season, uh, I usually do the, a phase or a block of general strength, for example, two to three sets of 16 to, four, to 24 repetitions with low loads, like 30 to 40 percent of 1RM, including circuit training with upper and lower body exercises, and we do this twice a week for eight to 12 weeks, and normally we do it in the early season. Then we might move on to a phase of hypertrophic type of strength, 
uh, for example, two sets of eight reps at 78, 75 to 80 uh, percent of one RM. But I like to do this only focusing on lower body exercises twice a week for about eight to 12 weeks. And we do this in the pre-competitive phase and the competitive phase. I'm not afraid of inducing a hypertrophy, although this is a hypertrophic type of training, I'm not afraid of inducing hypertrophy because we know the running uh, is going to inhibit the hypertrophic stimulus. And then we might move on to a phase of heavy strength. For example, three sets of three to five reps at 90 to 95% of 1RM. And again, when we do this, I like to focus on lower body exercises. We do this twice a week for three to four weeks in the pre-competitive phase. And of course, all this is simultaneously done with conversion to power. So basically with uh, sport specific training, swimming, cycling, and running. In addition to this type of training, we also do plyometric training, or we have done plyometric training in the past. And in this case, I don't try to reinvent the wheel. I don't try to make up my, my own plyometric exercises. What I do is use what has already been proven to be effective. So I take uh, Philo Saunders' uh, study, and we do either a full program at the beginning of the season, we might go for nine weeks, or at different points in the season, we might introduce a partial program. So we might say, oh, okay, now we have three weeks without racing, let's introduce this block of training, or let, let's introduce this block of training. So we use plyometric exercises in the past. The main reason for all this uh, strength work, in addition to the improvements in cycling and running economy or in cycling power, and Darren has already um, alluded to it, is the effects of a strength training on injury prevention. What you see here are Ainoa Murua's training volumes between 2004 and 2012. You will see that swimming goes from 720 kilometers to uh, 1,100 kilometers per season. Running goes, uh, sorry, cycling goes from uh, 9,000 kilometers to, uh, to 12,000 kilometers, and cycling uh, running ranges between uh, 1,700 and, and 2,800 kilometers. Plus, all these strength training sessions, and for four years, we also use plyometric training. Why do I show you this? Because this represents nine seasons of elite triathlon with two injuries. A plantar fasciitis in 2007 and a knee fat pad impingement in 2012, five weeks before the Olympics. That's it. Maybe luck, maybe a very resilient triathlete. But we have used this type of training with Eneko Janos as well. He has done, in the 10 years that I coached him, he has done the same type of core stability training, the same type of general strength, maximal strength, explosive strength, plyometric training. With him, we have tried uh, electrical stimulation for developing strength as well. We have done the conversion to power type of training. And in an Echo's case, between 2002 and 2011 that I coached him, he swam 9,000 kilometers, he cycled 165,000 kilometers, and he ran 30,000 kilometers. These are 10 seasons of elite triathlon with three injuries. Uh, shin splints in 2005, when he moved from the Olympic distance to the Ironman distance, and a couple of episodes of low back pain in 2008 and 2010. That did not keep him from training, only from running. He continued swimming and continued cycling. Luck, maybe. Very resilient triathlete, maybe. But this perception that I had for the role of strength training on injury prevention uh, was very nicely confirmed by a meta-analysis that was published last year. What you see here is a study that analyzed the effectiveness of exercise interventions to prevent sports injuries. Bad luck for some. Stretching does absolutely nothing in terms of injury prevention. 
this is a meta-analysis that includes about 24,000 athletes. No effect of stretching on injury prevention. Proprioceptive work, yeah, it does something. It helps. The most effective way of injury prevention on highly trained athletes is strength training. And if you do a combination of a stretching, proprioception, and strength training, it is less effective than doing only strength training. So the main conclusion from this meta-analysis was that the strength training reduced sports injuries to less than one-third, and overuse injuries could be almost half. So if you want to prevent injuries with your triathletes, do some solid strength training. And sometimes we don't have to invent uh, very complicated programs, or we have doubts quite often as coaches. But some athletes, if they are experienced enough, they know exactly what they need, and they will guide you. They will tell you what you need to do. This is an echo. In 2005, on week 36, he finished second at uh, Exterra, Spain. He was beaten by his brother. So I said, Eneko, what's, what's wrong? And he said, I need leg strength after all this Ironman training. That's the year he transitioned from Olympic distance to Ironman distance. If an athlete experienced and with good feel, and he is one of those, tells you that what he needs is a strength training for his legs, that's what he needs. You don't, even, you don't even need to measure anything. If he feels that what he needs, that's what he needs. So what we did was I designed a, a, a 10 week program, twice a week, so 20 sessions of two to three sets of eight repetitions of hypertrophic type of training. So 75 to 80% of one RM. And off he went. So on week 40, that's uh, exactly four weeks after this Xterra Spain, he won Xterra US Championships in Lake Tahoe. So basically he flew to uh, Nevada on Thursday, he looked at the course on Friday, he won the event on Saturday, and he flew home on Sunday. And he said, wow, that was easy. How did you feel? Oh, strong, good. Did they measure if he was getting stronger? No. But if he feels he's getting stronger, he's getting stronger. Week 43, he goes to Maui for Xterra World Championships, and he finished second after riding 50% of the bike leg on a flat tire. He's a humble guy, and he said, I could have won this thing by five minutes. How's your strength? Good. I feel really strong and really powerful. Okay. Week 48, first Ironman he finished, he finished second in, uh, in Baselton in Australia. Do you feel strong? Yep. Could I measure? No, it's impossible. I, there was no way I could measure if the program was being effective. How can I measure if he's in the United States, then a week later or two weeks later he's in Hawaii, and then two weeks later he's in Australia? There is no way to measure. But if he, if, if he feels that he's getting stronger, even if he's not, his perception is already having a positive effect. So whether it is real or whether it is a placebo effect, the conclusion is that the work was paying off. OK, uh, uh, a little bit about strength training for Olympic swimming. This is the, the work that we did for four years with the Spanish swimming team in the lead up to the London Olympics. Uh, I was fortunate to work with a head coach and a very good coach, uh, Fred Vernieu. The head coach was uh, Luis Villanueva, who had very similar ideas to mine. And we felt that these were very, very good swimmers, but not very good overall athletes. So we felt that these athletes lacked athletic ability. And we wanted to work on that. Because you can be a very, very good swimmer, but then you get out of the water and you are unable to do anything else. So we had a strong focus on cross training during all our training camps. We played uh, beach volleyball. We went hiking in the mountains. We went kayaking in the sea. 
we did the skiing during training camps in Sierra Nevada. We went uh, running, uh, cycling, name it. We had a very strong focus on core stability and strength, core strength, general strength, both on pool deck and in the gym with the help of uh, the, uh, the, the, the physio of the, uh, of the team and also using strength and conditioning coaches that were available in different places where we would go for training camps. So if we went to a training camp in Tenerife and we knew that there was a good strength training coach working with the football club, we would invite him over. Can you do a couple of sessions with our swimmers to increase the, uh, the, uh, the, the bank of possible exercises that our athletes were able to do and able to learn? Of course, we did classic strength training with, uh, with machines and also with, with free weights. But we thought, why don't we try something that nobody does in swimming? And we also worked on eccentric overload type of training. As far as we knew in 2009, nobody was using eccentric overload for, uh, for swimming. So we used uh, Versa pulleys and we used yo-yo uh, isoinertial -iso machines. And we figured out ways of measuring the force that the athletes were developing while using these technologies. What you see here is our uh, strength uh, expert, Julio Toes, uh, with a Versa pulley attached to a strain gauge, attach attached to a TRX, attached to a bench in the gym to simulate the pull. Uh, during a swimming exercise. Here you see uh, one of the athletes working with the Versa pulley. We used instability exercises uh, mixed up with whole, whole body vibration. But we, we didn't use commercially available whole body vibra uh, vibration machines because those are only tickling uh, elite athletes. We, we had custom made platforms that if you turn them on right here within 30 seconds, they would be jumping up and down at the end of the room. So machines that provided a real stimulus for this type of athletes. And I'm going to give you a, an example of the work that we did with Mireya Belmonte. Mireya, Mireya was the least at athletic of all our swimmers. When Fred Vernieu arrived, Mireya was unable to do a single pull-up. A swimmer, unable to do a pull-up. Um, but she worked harder than anyone else, harder than anyone else. And this is Mireya, two and a half years later, doing pull-ups with 16% of her body mass hanging from her legs. This is Mireya doing a half squat, and I say half because it's not even a, a third of a squat with 177% of her body mass. And this is her doing lying row with 113% um, of her body mass. This was in the lead up to, uh, to the London Olympics. But after that, she continued doing this type of work. This is uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2014, 2015. And they included, they included additional type of, uh, of strength training, like lying row with immediate feedback. You can see her with the computer here, visualizing the power that she's producing in every repetition. Same thing here during the bench press. Or more specific type of work. This is some work uh, with resisted underwater swimming in, in Sierra Nevada. She's attached to a, to a belt and uh, to a weight rack. Uh, normally it works. And it's a good video. Or we mix that up with uh, immediate uh, visual feedback after doing some strength training, some uh, quick starts and turns, and immediate feedback on, on full side. Mm.
So she goes back immediately after the start with a force platform on the starting block. She can go to the screen and analyze that with the biomechanist and with the uh, strength and conditioning coach. Of course, Fred, Fred is incredi incredibly uh, imaginative. So he has, he comes up with, uh, with a lot of ideas. Here you see the group doing some strength training in a park in, uh, in Barcelona or doing a stand-up paddling. Or here they are pushing up a car at 3,200 meters in Sierra Nevada. This is not specific, but it's quite a specific type of work for the starts and the turns in swimming. Fortunately, you cannot see it. But if you ask Fred, why do you do so much strength work with Mireya? Mireya swims the longest events in swimming, the easy ones, 200 butterfly, 400 IM, 400 freestyle, 800 freestyle, 15, 000, uh, 1,500 freestyle, and now she's doing 5Ks open water. So the longest events in swimming. And this is the answer that Fred might give you. In endurance swimming events, maximal strength work is important to develop explosive qualities, starts and turns, but also because, because it allows to work on a speed and it just fa facilitates the initial meters of the event. In Mireya's case, it allows her to swim the first 400 meters of an 800 meter event with certain ease, thanks to her strength and speed, and then the second part in constant acceleration, pushing more and more on the water with a cake that gets stronger and stronger. Mireya won two silver medals in London, half a million medals in uh, Barcelona World Championships and the World Cup in 2013, and I think she also won five gold medals in Doha in short course world championships. What are the mechanisms for these uh, strength gains, uh, for these uh, strength-induced improvements in endurance performance? Well, according to two of the world's biggest experts, Per Agard and Truls Rastad, the adaptive mechanisms might involve a conversion of fast twitch fibers, uh, fi fast twitch two weeks fibers into fatigue resistant type 2A muscle fibers, along with improved muscle strength as measured with maximal voluntary contraction and rapid force characteristics measured by way of the rate of force development. In addition, improvements in neuromuscular function and musculotendinous stiffness might also contribute to improved endurance performance after concurrent strength and endurance training. So basically, there are three mechanisms, don't get afraid. There are three mechanisms by which you will improve your short duration endurance, so between zero and 15 minutes, and your long duration endurance. The first mechanism is by either increasing your muscle size or improving neuromuscular function. This is going to have an effect on your maximal voluntary contraction and your rate of force development, and that will affect your fatigability, which will, of course, have a direct effect on short-term and long-term endurance, but your improvement in rates of force development is going to improve your sprint ability, and that might help you win an event at the end of the event, either winning a race in the final sprint, in cycling, or in running. The second mechanism would be an increase in the percentage of type 2A muscle fibers, which is going to reduce fatigability and that will have a direct effect on short-term endurance and long-term endurance. And the third mechanism is the increase in muscle tendon stiffness, which will have a significant effect on the economy of movement. So the cost of running or the cost of cycling, particularly the cost of running, will uh, be reduced. If you want to optimize concurrent strength and endurance training, there are some things that you have, to, you have to keep in mind. Firstly, to avoid molecular interference. Molecular interference has been shown to happen when you do aerobic training before resistance training, when there is a close proximity between the two types of stimulus, when you increase the intensity of the aerobic workout, and when you increase the volume of the aerobic workout. These four uh, conditions 
are going to have an effect on residual fatigue and are going to have an effect on substrate depletion. And that might compromise um, the, the resistance training stimulus and it might decrease the anabolic response to resistance training. However, we know that these molecular interference effects have been shown in athletes who are not used to doing both types of training simultaneously. So future work examining the existence of this molecular interference should be done on athletes who have been doing concurrent exercise for years, such as rowers, or nowadays many professional cyclists, or nowadays many triathletes and swimmers. Because we do, know, we do not know to what extent this molecular interference effect is also real on highly trained athletes who are accustomed to this type of training. In any case, the molecular interference effect occurs mainly when in your endurance training, you are focusing on cardiovascular adaptations, that is on central adaptations. And, uh, sorry, when you do that type of work and simultaneously you are doing resistance training focusing on central adaptations, neural adaptations, there is no problem. You can do those two works simultaneously and there is no concurrence. The problem occurs here in the middle. So when you are looking for peripheral, ad peripheral ad adaptations with your strength training and you are also trying to get peripheral adaptations with your aerobic training, that's the zone of interference. <coughs> that's when we are going to have problems according to the model of Doherty and Sporer. A more recent evolution of that model uh, was published by Garcia Pallares and Izquierdo, and basically you have the same thing. Here you see your endurance training, here you see your resistance training. Here you see your aim, central adaptations, or peripheral adaptations. When you do your endurance looking for central adaptations and your resistance doing for central adaptations, very little interference. Central adaptations with endurance and peripheral adaptations with resistance, very little interference, and vice versa. The main interference is going to occur when you try to develop simultaneously your peripheral adaptations in your endurance training and your peripheral adaptations in your resistance training. That's when we have a problem. And those are the things we have to keep in mind when we design our strength training programs. So the conclusions and practical implications. These are the effects of heavy and explosive strength training on endurance performance. The potential positive uh, physiological and performance effects are here. Improved VO2 max, there is no evidence of benefit. Exercise economy, anaerobic capacity, lactate threshold, delayed fatigue, maximal strength, rate of force development, maximal speed, endurance performance. Now we can say yes, there is evidence of benefit. There are some potential negative effects that have mostly to do with the increase in body mass. So is there evidence of a negative effect of this type of work on body mass? No. If we do the right type of training, heavy strength, explosive, plyometric. Therefore, because there is going to be no increase in body mass, the other potential negative mechanisms like compromised relative VO2 max, increased diffusion distance, reduced capillarization, and reduced oxidative enzyme activity, the evidence is no. To finish, to increase the probability of improved endurance performance subsequent to a strength training period, the strength training exercises should involve similar muscle groups and imitate the sport's specific movements. Rate of force development might be increased if the athlete focuses on performing the concentric phase of the lift as quickly as possible. Two strength training sessions per week designed as a daily undulating periodized program is typically enough to achieve a sufficient increase in strength during a 12-week training period. 
Athletes are advised to perform between four and 10 repetitions and two to three sets with approximately two to three minutes of rest in between sets. During the competitive season or in training periods when development of strength is not prioritized, when it becomes secondary to develop strength, approximately one strength training session per week with very low volume, sometimes four exercises, two sets is enough to maintain adaptations. But with high intensity, seems to maintain the previous strength training adaptations. So if you stop strength training during the season, you are not going to maintain your values. If you do one session per week of high intensity, even if the volume is really low, you might maintain for the duration of the competitive phase the strength gains that you have achieved in the pre-season. Merci beaucoup. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, just thinking considerations for females and maybe testosterone levels, that kind of thing. I don't think there are, uh, or I don't know of uh, any studies reporting the testosterone values of endurance female athletes uh, during either endurance training only or simultaneous uh, endurance and strength training. So I could not give you an answer with, uh, with, with a scientific basis. When I program these strength training uh, sessions with, uh, with an endurance or with endurance female athletes, I'm not thinking hormones. I'm, th I'm mostly thinking, uh, firstly, core stability, secondly, injury prevention, and I'm thinking the gains in running economy that have been described, the gains in power on the bike that have been described, the gains in the, your position in the water and your ability to, to pull and apply forces in the water. I'm not really thinking physiology or physiological adaptations. I'm thinking more uh, functional type of adaptations. So I couldn't, I couldn't give you an answer about that. Okay, thank you very much, Nigo.